political sciences uh, uh, in Igeo, uh, which was founded in 1967 as a commission of the International Union of Geological Science. And uh, one year later, in 1968 in Paris, he became affiliated also to the International Union of History and Philosophy of Science. And now he's, he's, he's affiliated to the Division of History of Science and Technology. Uh, so the role of this commission, which is not an association because uh, its members are nominated through a process of evaluation of their work and their curricula, uh, has specific tasks, working tasks. At the beginning, one of the tasks, which I think is still very important, is to create a bibliographical database on our And uh, his work, this work of these people that started, uh, especially at the middle of the 1960s and early uh, 1970s, was to establish a new research field, because historiogeology is quite one of the youngest branches of the history of sciences and also to establish the importance of history within the geological sciences themselves. So until the late 1960s, only occasional works, sometimes Whiggish work, sometimes too based on internal approach, uh, to a geographic maybe, to a bit too uh, nationalistic sometimes, have been produced. But after that period, after the 1960s, late 1960s, uh, we had an historiography of geological science which quickly found its place and its methodology. Today, we have a membership of our commission that is quite large. It can be um, an example of, uh, of, um, of interest in this field. More than 310 nominated members and represented 57 countries with 14 national affiliated associations. So, local groups in history of geological sciences within uh, geological societies or history of science societies or in any other field. And uh, if we look at the profession of the members, we found a great variety. We have not only giants, geoscientists, so different kind of uh, scientists of the, um, of the geological uh, sciences. Uh, they were the majority at the beginning, the, the big majority, but now it's not like like in the 60s, and we have so many historians of science too, from universities and research institutes. But they are not only these two categories part of this group. We have scholars in disciplines such as philosophy or literature, and we have scholars from other scientific fields, people working in museums, in libraries, in archives, teachers at different levels. So potentially a very good interdisciplinary base. Of course, you must make it work. So it is not enough to be part of a group with many skills if then everybody remains in his own, in her own comfort zone of special knowledge and research methodology. So it is essential to make those skills to understand each other and work together constantly in a sort of mutual discovery and constantly constant recognition. So writing and publishing books, writing and publishing papers, present talks at meetings and conferences, where we can share and discuss ideas and uh, interpretation, and also try to transfer all of this, all our knowledge to teaching. They are all important activities, of course. It is our work, after all, but for the future, they can be enriched and revisited by new challenges. It's what I was to just summarize now. Um, but I will begin with saying that the main challenge is actually to be really interdisciplinary. It is not easy at all. Sometimes it's a word, it's a statement, but it does, it's, not, it's not followed by actually real actions in that sense, because it involves a change in mentality, a change in the habit of many of us. So for the historians of geology, one future challenge can certainly be, in our opinion, to support the trend already in action in the last few decades, which has enlarged the focus of the research from papers, books, manuscripts, letters, drawings, maps, and so on, and many other forms of verbal communication and visual language to objects, tools, specimens, and above all, places, physical places, including roots in the field. Moreover, another series of challenges may be related to enlarge the borders of the geohistorical research, not only by using more knowledge and inputs from uh, material cultures, but also increasing the focus on the role of uh, the so-called forgotten people and forgotten places, which has been forgotten by our 
relatively young historiography in several cases. So we still have to fill that gap. Just a few key words, just a few names. For example, women, miners, technicians, regions of the world less explored and less considered by a too wrongly Eurocentric perspective or Western perspective. So, for example, it's not important to establish, like they're still debating in some areas of our, of our discipline, the priority between British and Italian geology in the 19th century is not important. It's much more important to understand about early studies in the, about the Hertz, for example, in Southern Asia. We, we, know, we know very little about that. And also another aspect to support and a challenge to, to, to follow is increase the interaction with these stories, these stories of technology and reduce a bit the attention towards the history of ideas, which are important, but has been too much overwhelming in our tradition, in our historiographical tradition. Another important challenge is certainly to the aim to establish a different dialogue with the sciences. And this can be based on contribution by us of historical data and historical analysis for contemporary debates on the state of the planet. Again, so natural events into geological and earth sciences. But I must uh, uh, make it clear here that this is not only a collection of data for projects made by scientists, but must be a proposal of evaluation of historical data with the knowledge of historical context and perspective and mistakes and misunderstandings, something that scientists usually don't like to get because they don't consider that useful for their project. Or I've been working at the very beginning of my, on my path uh, of, uh, with the seismologist and being an historian of geology, they were interested in our work, in my work, because I could provide data for their catalogs of earthquakes. In Italy, we have this problem quite, quite widespread. And I was trying to give them also information about the context, about the theories, about why this data was, was placed in history that would be useful as well, but they were not interested in that. They wanted to recreate a map of the intensity of the, of the strength of the earthquake of this, let's say, 16th century in order to see the possibility of a, of a, of a risk now. Understandable, but not enough, not uh, a possibility to uh, work at the same level. Historiogeological sciences should be not simply at the service of science, but should be a partner, a proponent at the same level of the science, of the scientist, uh, within a teamwork, of course. Um, for example, the present case of the discussion on the Anthropocene that I seen there was a talk also in one of the previous sessions today, uh, but it's very much debated within the history of science as well, but not only uh, geography, ecology, general history, uh, ancient history, many voices on this topic. At the end of the day, the, is, is a matter of fact that Anthropocene as a new geological epoch is both more strongly supported by non-scientists than scientists. Geologists are very careful about this, and they try to minimize the possibility to create this new period of research. So we need to discuss on the same level, but I would like to go to the end with, uh, finally, there's a challenge very important, which can open new ways of fruitful interaction between scientists, historians, and general public, but also uh, with local administration, with uh, what they being called the stakeholders. So I'm talking about a project which uh, in IGEO, our commission has started with within the IUGS, the Union of Geological Sciences, on the geological heritage sites, which are usually a matter for geologists or for, uh, or for people working on, on heritage studies. But the role of history, historical geosites and georoutes, places and localities, not museums, not made by men, places studied by men, where a significant geological theory or interpretation has been established, have become place for fundamental observation and description were made in the past. And I must say that the world of geosciences, thanks also to our colleagues in the International Commission of Geoheritage now, has realized the importance of the historical value in order to define the geosites. And we started a real important dialogue and we produced already uh, a book, a material, a meeting, and these things have been going to be proposed in the next occasions of, uh, of interaction. It's a very fruitful collaboration uh, has started over the last two years, 
And this interdisciplinary activity may also provide tools for geotourism and for revaluation of territories. The people have to be aware about the place where they live and so on. So most of these challenges can be found, for example, in the subjects of the sessions, workshop proposals that INIGEO has submitted for the next International Geological Congress in Busan, South Korea in August 2024. Because we have session about, and I just quote them quickly, history of women in geology, trailblazers, leaders, and those in the shadows, hidden histories in geological sciences, geosites and georoots in the history of geological sciences, Anthropocene history and the geosciences, contribution to contemporary debates, history of geoscientific travels in Asia and beyond. You see all the topics. But of course, now we're thinking of the topics we will propose for the next International Congress of History of Science and Technology in New Zealand. We have just received the call days ago in 2025. But I also, I, I really look forward now to listen what you think about these ideas or challenges for the future of our discipline. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Ezio. And uh, now we move on to uh, Professor Donald Opitz, who is going to give his talk. He is an associate professor at the Paul University in Chicago. Uh, his research in gender history of science analyzes entanglements between gender and imperialism in science in the 19th and 20th centuries with a focus on the transnational women's movement in the agricultural part of cultural uh, sciences. Uh, John's talk is entitled The Future of Women, Gender and Sexuality Studies in the History of Science, Technology and Medicine. And he is representing the Commission on the uh, DHST's Commission on Women and Gender in the History of Science, and Technology and Medicine. John, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, and thanks to our conference organizers, uh, the DHST and the BSHS, and also to my colleagues at the Commission on Women and Gender in History of Science, Technology, and Medicine for nominating me to talk on this theme, the future of women, gender, and sexuality studies in the history of science, technology, and medicine. Uh, frankly, their nomination surprised me. Uh, <laughs> But it made sense after it was explained to me. Um, first, I wrote a paper on the historiography of gender history of science, uh, past and present, with an eye to the future for the volume soon to be published by Bloomsbury and debating contemporary approaches to the history of science, edited by Lucas Verboot. While drafting the paper, I reached out to several of my commission colleagues for their perspectives on the early days of our field as it unfolded in various countries uh, so that I uh, would have a more international perspective uh, beyond the US, the context which I know best. Based on their input, I was awakened to the wide range of pathbreaking works emanating from the UK and various European countries, especially France, Spain, Denmark, Germany, and so forth, as well as the early efforts to extend gender history of science to geographies well beyond Western Europe and North America. Secondly, I gave a talk in a session at Women, Gender, and Science, co-organized by my commission colleagues, Maria Santes Mases and Andrea Nunez Casal for the European Society for the History of Science in Brussels last year. And Maria felt that my extempore uh, presentation style would fit in well with uh, the spirit of the, of the DHSD festival. Uh, I mentioned these points because I have my commission colleagues in mind as both inspirers and stakeholders uh, to whom I feel a great sense of debt and accountability. Um, and I should say, I accepted this nomination reluctantly, mainly because let's be honest, I'm a cis white man of European heritage based in the US. Me talk about the future of women, gender and sexuality and history of science, technology and med medicine especially in a context in which the field is all about bringing forward diverse voices that historically have been suppressed or sidelined. And then there's the nascent status of my own uh, efforts to help push the frontiers of the field, making me feel rather unqualified, at least for now, to say anything well-informed about its future. But then a voice went out in my head and said to me, get over yourself, Don. After all, I've been as active in this field as many of my peers, so why not me? 
And if we're going to talk about diversifying this area, we certainly could use more than a few token men. Um, and the picture that you see up here is from a commission conference in uh, Cambridge in 1999. And the arrow is pointing to me as a young graduate student uh, among the sea of uh, women scholars. So listen up guys, as Uncle Sam called upon his fellow American men for joining the world war efforts, we need you. Okay, on a somewhat more serious note, and perhaps with less American patriotism, it's important for me to say that I'm only one scholarly voice in a very robust, diverse subfield of history of science, technology, and medicine, one that engages many disciplinary perspectives and hosts quite a few active research programs internationally. In the short time that I have, I will offer a few highlights of the field's historiographical trajectory and suggest directions for pushing its frontiers through new scholarly and professional endeavors. So let's begin thinking about uh, where we have been in the past, as we historians like to do. Uh, just to reassure everyone, I'm only going to uh, be brief and impressionistic here. Uh, the field of gender studies and history of science, technology, and medicine basically emerged in the 1970s, as women's and gender studies did within many disciplines internationally. The pioneering studies actually came primarily in the format of conference papers that afterwards were published in anthologies and journal special issues, such as the, such as the examples that you see here. It was a practice that continued well into the 90s, and indeed is still very much alive today, as, as we will see. But there were also important monographs addressing the status of women in science, both in Europe and North America. These and others not pictured here became our textbooks for college courses on women, gender, and science. The historiography emphasized certain durable themes, and I highlight here only one that has been influential in my own work, and thinking about in thinking about women, gender, and science. And that is the dynamics of gender and collaborative units, especially scientific couples and families, precisely because the relative absence of women historically in laboratories and professional spaces meant we had to go to those locations where they were indeed doing scientific work, often private spaces of the home and, and other, other sites. The historiography always involves interrogations of the very concepts employed in our histories, women, gender, science, and so on. And to this end, an entire literature that might be termed gender STS studies or feminist STS studies accompanied and intersected with uh, the, uh, the growth of the history itself. In other words, the historiography has always been a dynamic one theoretically. And most of the scholars were doing both empirical historical work as well as theoretical work. Our recently departed colleague Evelyn Fox Keller being an emblematic example not only did her work impact our thinking on gender and science, it also gave us such histories as her biography of Barbara McClintock. Very briefly, the field did not reside in silos of science, technology, and medicine. Indeed, these disciplines and their scholars belong to a shared collective because how gender was constructed involved the overlapping influences of science, technology, and medicine. Here are some examples of the early tech literature. This was important because of how it challenged ideas about technology as gender neutral and technology as unbecoming of femininity. Women could and did do technology. And just to emphasize the point, the early scholarship was international and while springs of research popped up in many countries, France, Spain, Denmark, Germany, Sweden, Hungary, and the list just goes on and on. The early membership lists of the commission prove the point of how broad in scope the interest in this field truly was. So where are we now? Well, to characterize the field in the way that I've been experiencing it, there's been an outpouring of rich monographs and themed collections that dig in to more specialized topics as well as intersectional approaches to the study of gender and sexuality, and sexuality indeed attracting a lot of energy. The studies uh, today are paying attention not only to women and femininity, 
but also men and masculinity. And they are questioning the logics and technologies that produce these binary ways of categorizing identity. There's much more attention to sexual fluidity, transgenderism, as well as indigenous and post-colonial ways of understanding gender expression and sexuality. The new historiography is giving us exciting new studies focusing on particular disciplines. And we just heard from Ezio about uh, geology. So that, that's really encouraging. Um, and also renewed perspectives within international and transnational contexts. But what about the future? The pandemic has actually been interesting in provoking projects that enabled people to come together uh, through technology across distances. And there's been a bumper crop of international conferences and workshops, uh, which in turn are leading to new publications that are still in progress. So these are very exciting uh, developments that we look forward to. There is also a renewed effort to bring greater visibility and accessibility to primary sources critical to our scholarship and teaching. These projects are especially uh, emphasizing the need to recover sources that were suppressed under the influence of, colonial, of the colonial archive and its post-colonial legacies. While not new, in a context in which discrimination and hostility to women, LGBTQ persons, and ethnic slash cultural minorities in science, historians are increasingly partnering with scientists to combat inequality and advocate for cultural change. Here, historian Kimberly Hamlin contributed an historical perspective to what is known as the Bearded Lady Project, focusing on discrimination of women in paleontology. Uh, we need more of that. And uh, here, Nathaniel Comfort, another good guy, has recently illustrated how we can bring our works to scientific audiences through such journals as Nature. Our DHSD is participating in uh, what was known as the uh, uh, Global Gender Gap Project, largely thanks to the efforts of our colleague, Catherine uh, Jami. This is another way in which our field of HSTM can partner with other scientific societies uh, to strive for gender equality across the professions. Catherine talked about uh, this in an earlier session of the DHST Festival. So if you had not seen her talk, uh, be sure to return to the recording. We also need to elevate gender and infuse it in all of our efforts to advance and innovate in HSTM, such as the volume I had mentioned earlier by Lucas Verbook, uh, which includes a chapter on gender history of science, uh, actually two chapters, I should say, um, and within conferences like this current festival. So let's keep it up. Uh, to close, I want to bring forward the words of a few of our field's founders who individually and collectively emphasize the need for greater accessibility to sources, an intersectional non-binary approach to gender, and to explore gender in relation to race, sexuality, and globalization. Finally, I invite participants uh, in this festival to learn more about the commission by visiting our website and by joining our listserv, which you can do uh, by going to the website and signing up. Thank you. Thank you so much, Don. Now we move on to uh, the last talk the session, uh, which will be given by Professor Elena Caladeri, uh, who is an associate professor of history of science at the University of Padua in Italy, uh, and also the president of the Italian Society for the History of Science. She's also the scientific director of the Botanic Museum uh, at the University of Padova, and the ed editor-in-chief uh, of Nuncius, a uh, very well-known journal in our area. Uh, Elena is going to talk about the future of the history of science in Italy, uh, the member country which she is representing here to the federal. The floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. It's an honor to be here and thank you for uh, the organizer for this amazing event and also for Italy for <laughs> choosing me to represent uh, uh, it in this festival. Yeah, uh, so 
uh, I will speak mostly <laughs> as the president of the Italian Society for the History of Science. Uh, what I want to tell you is a bit, um, yeah, what is happening right now in Italy and uh, the future perspective, perspective of our discipline in Italy. So, uh, firstly, just uh, a brief history. So, as you well know, Italy has a long tradition in the field of the history of science. Uh, so we have from different perspectives. So perspective from philosophy, more on philosophy, more on material aspects. So you see Andrea Corsini or uh, Maria Luisa uh, Bonelli in Florence. So, uh, or uh, people like Aldo Mieli, so very important also in terms of founding the journals. Uh, or Federico Enriquez, uh, or um, in the um, second part uh, of the um, 20th century, Ludovico Gemonat and Vittorio Sumenzi, more dialoguing also with philosophy, but also from the science. So, this is just briefly just to give you an idea that in, already in the past uh, we have uh, different perspectives. Uh, uh, in approaching uh, um, history of science. Uh, um, in other uh, uh, oh, so it's better. So maybe are you open? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, for, for me it's a little bit. Uh, Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me fine or not? So for, for me it's much better. Okay. Now that you are. Ah, okay, so it's better. So, okay, sorry. Yeah. So, what is happening now? Uh, so, as a society, as the Italian Society for the History of Science, we are working inside the university and outside in the society. And uh, so, just to give you an idea, so uh, right now, uh, the Italian Society has to um, 137 members, uh, of which uh, 96 are early career scholars. And uh, for us, it's a great success uh, because uh, it means that uh, we have young scholars that are also active in our society and uh, uh, in our university or school or institutions. And we have 100. 49 regular members and two institutional members that are the two main museums in Italy, Oyster Science, that is the uh, Museo Galileo in Florence, and the National Museum of Science and Technology, Leonardo da Vinci in Milan. But as you can see, so I think that uh, the society has a lot of members, a lot of energy, uh, but if you see the academic positions of our discipline in Italy, uh, so we, uh, um, it, it's going better, but uh, we have 61 position, which is 18 for professor, 23 associate professor, um, for permanent researchers, uh, five tenure track researchers, and 11 university and professor. So uh, some of them are ERC, so with European funding, so multiple fellows, and so uh, it's growing also, the, the European funding are growing in Italy. So you see um, a society, I think, uh, with a lot of members, uh, the position in, in uh, the um, at university that are growing, uh, and we are working as society inside and outside uh, the university, so the academic uh, uh, environment, uh, so to speak. Uh, where are in Italy the uh, chair of history of science? They are mainly in the humanities, um, maybe in the uh, philosophy department, but also in the history department. So myself, I teach uh, um, uh, in a history department, uh, but also in uh, the scientific department, so physics, biology, myself, I, I have a collaboration that a lot of colleagues have uh, with uh, scientific department, uh, with biology, with botany, and I think that is one of the most important potentialities of our discipline, of course, not only in Italy, but uh, we are trying to collaborate with scientific uh, 
um, colleagues with sci uh, scientists and scientific departments. And uh, yeah, uh, I'm 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 very sorry to interrupt you again, but your sound is uh, uh, is awful once again. Yeah, it's it's like garbled. Uh, I, I don't know if if it's I, your microphone. Perhaps if uh, you tried uh, the uh, I try to the, the, without video, maybe it's let's, better. Let's I uh, I think it, it it's better, but let's let's okay. give it a try. Okay. Thank okay. you. Yeah, Thank sorry, you. sorry. <laughs> and no, uh, no. no. <laughs> uh, so the society is trying to collaborate with uh, museums, uh, uh, archives, libraries, and the school also. So we have a lot of teaching programs uh, of bringing history of science in the school uh, and also with other uh, scientific associations. Uh, so uh, the National Association of uh, Scientific Museums or the Philosophy of Science Society and History of Physics and Astronomy. So we are trying uh, to foster uh, all these relationship uh, uh, in Italy. And so we have uh, a new definition of history of science uh, for uh, uh, university, so we have worked together with uh, Ezio Vaccari that uh, is part uh, of the, the council of the society and with the other members. Uh, we have discussed a lot a new definition for uh, uh, our so discipline in Italian uh, uh, academy, and uh, this definition should be adopted by the end of the, this year by the Italian government. And just to stress some aspects, uh, you see we have stressed a lot uh, um, the relationship with the other scientists, but also the enhancement of tangible and intangible uh, uh, heritage, for example, uh, or uh, so working a lot uh, with archives, books, uh, and museums, uh, and uh, also uh, stressing the fact that uh, it could be a link between a humanistic and scientific disciplines, for example. So um, you can read, uh, and I'm sorry for my <laughs> uh, connection. Uh, so, but, and you see also, also uh, the fact that we have stressed uh, uh, the uh, gender, for example, uh, or also public and community dimensions or, uh, with sociology of science. So we are trying to dialogue uh, with, very, uh, with other uh, fields of research from the science, but also from other fields of the humanities. And so, to us uh, was a huge challenge. So for our community to rethink uh, what is history of science right now in Italy, but not only. I know that uh, also the HSS is working on a, uh, broadening the definition. You, it's, it's good to broaden, uh, but maybe uh, sometimes it could be too much. I don't know. So you, you need, uh, uh, to define. So this was a great adventure last year. And we have a new journal that is Scientia and is open access if you want to have a look. We published the first issue in June. Uh, it's open access, but also our copies for the society is a huge investment <laughs> in terms of fundings. And we publish in English, but also in Italian, because we want to foster our field of research in Italy, also involving people from not only from the academy, but also from the other institution or that they work in the school and in the educational field. So uh, if you want to have a look, you can, it's open access. And they, uh, it's uh, two issues per year. So. Uh, then we organize a congress for young scholars, but also the national congress. So uh, we meet uh, every year and this is a, a huge effort, but it's important to our community to meet each other, to discuss topics. Uh, and uh, we are doing uh, uh, so uh, every year and the next national congress 
uh, took place in Bari next year. So uh, just to give you an idea of what is happening in Italy, so I think that uh, something is going on. So we are thinking a lot on our discipline. We are trying to communicate and connect it with the society. And for the future, we, would, we are starting a working group uh, on the international side to foster also the relationship with uh, uh, other society or encouraging the participation of Italian scholars uh, abroad and also to call uh, uh, people from abroad to Italy to join our Congress and see what is happening uh, in our community. So I hope that the journal would help us in disseminating our ideas and research. And uh, so we have two other uh, working group uh, working on heritage museum and so material culture uh, and also on school. So bringing and working with professor in the school about history of science as a mean of um, working together with from different disciplines. So we are using in a way a lot this concept of working together also in the school and not only in, uh, in the academic field. So uh, thank you and sorry for my connection. And if you want to follow us, we have a website and we are. Um, so thank you, sorry. <laughs> yeah, please, thank you so much, Lena and all of us have got grown used to all kinds of internet problems, no, over the, the <laughs> last three years. And uh, we could uh, uh, listen to you loud and clear. And uh, now we have about 17 minutes for a uh, discussion. I, I want to stimulate the audience to send in uh, your questions using the, the Q and A uh, uh, button. It would be a shame. I have a lot of questions, but it would be a shame if uh, I monopolized the, the debate. But well, while people uh, start to formulate their questions, uh, let me pose one for each one of you. Uh, so I'm going to do this in the same order of the dots for Prezio. Uh, I would like to know a little bit about your thoughts on the relationship between the history of science and technology and environmental history. I think you are very well positioned to, to give us uh, some light on this. Uh, I personally think that it's, it's a difficult relationship. I think it should be much more strong, much you know, much stronger, much more uh, uh, like commonplace, but no, we have separate forums, separate journals, separate everything. And environmental history has been promoting, I think a renewal in, uh, in history itself, in historiography itself. So I think you are super well positioned to, to say something about it. Uh, let me, me make the three questions because then Perhaps I can just shut up and the audience uh, uh, will start to send in things. Now, uh, for you, John, uh, I'm curious about the problem of standpoints, uh, which is, of course, central to, to gender studies. Uh, is it different uh, to make gender history for instance, from where you are, geographically, institutionally, uh, politically, uh, in the gender spectrum, uh, then it would be to do gender history of science and technology, like from the global south or from, I don't know, from all other places. How, how to solve this, this question? And now for uh, Elena, uh, I think the history of science and technology in, in Italy is recognized for its uh, uh, really strong affiliation to, to a tradition of the history of ideas 
and I, I say this in in the most you know admiring way in, in the most in, in the noblest sense of the uh, uh, the the term. Uh, I was on wondering how STS, you know, science and technology studies and things like this, where do they fall in the uh, history of science and technology uh, panorama in, in Italy uh, present currently? And so as you, please. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Tomas. Yes. It's an important question, and I agree with you fully about the need of uh, um, a much, much, much stronger wider interaction between histories of science and environmental history. But um, it's a matter of entangled interaction, in my opinion, because not only environmental history should be involved, but also geography and topics related to geographical studies. In my opinion, this is another another field that has not. Uh, talking off with us as historian and historian of science in particular. Um, it's not that we are in a privileged position in this moment, because I must say also for the historian of geology to look at the environmental history, it's not so normal. So it's not so easy, let's say, because we need to look at history of geology in a different way. For example, when the concept of environment has been established and who started this concept within geological world or other histo history, uh, research in, in natural environment, or maybe geographers. Um, the, the historian of geologists have been focusing for a very long time on the development of theoretical idea on the, on the, on the, on the history of the, of the planet, and uh, a bit less on the interaction with all the other aspects of what we call now environment. So I, I, I consider that an open field research, but um, I certainly consider important to work on environmental history as well as in history of science. I have uh, one of my first PhD students many years ago in Subria, who is now an historian of science uh, working in the field uh, of history of mining in contemporary age, uranium environmental problems. You wrote a book about um, a debate about the, the nuclear, the use of nuclear energy in Italy in the 1970s. Started as an historian of geology, like me, in the 18th century, following, of course, my suggestion. Then moved in all these different ways, including environmental history, where he published papers there. For example, his name is Andrea Candela. I must, <laughs> I must say that because he's, uh, now I presented all, all the person. But uh, I'm happy that you know this new generation has has has, um, has has kept away to study the history of you know some technology and uh, and the ecology as well. So that's that's the what I can say about it. Okay, thank you. As you, Don, please. Uh, thank you, Thomas, and I appreciate the question, uh, which I think is uh, a critical one uh, as we think about the field more more globally. Um, I will say that you know the whole spirit behind the gender gap project was to point out that inequality exists everywhere in the sciences. Um, it, you know there was uh, data collections happening across disciplines and across countries, including the global south. And you know this is something that Catherine Jami could speak to, but um, you know, the, the problem persists um, internationally, and so there's a need for advocacy and uh, bringing greater visibility uh, to, you know, the origins of, of you know, inequality, um, which are, you know, both historical and, and cultural, um, and then coming up with uh, solutions, you know, and, and, you know, the Gender Gap Report has an entire uh, list of recommendations, you know, that involve you know, teaching, um, also parenting, um, what professional societies can do, uh, and, and so on. Um, so I just want to say that in the space of, you know, sort of activism, you know, there's sort of a shared uh, um, mission, as it were, um, and a shared need, you know, for gender studies uh, in the sciences. And now how that gets framed and uh, how that gets carried out, of course, is going to vary depending on, uh, you know, different local contexts. And that brings me to my second point, which is um, I think uh, 
In terms of historical practice, uh, you know, the field as it's uh, developed over over the uh, years um, has been very heavily uh, influenced by Western traditions. Um, and you know, the, the directions now are to think more. Uh, when we think more globally, is to consider uh, post-colonial perspectives, decolonial perspectives. Um, you know, how uh, indigenous voices uh, uh, reshapes the narratives and even how we think about uh, the sciences, uh, you know, within this field. Um, I, and, and I don't want to make it sound like, you know, like th there's going to be dramatic differences when we move to a global south uh, context. Uh, and, and I'm thinking here of a recent biography that Preetha Nair had uh, put out um, uh, about Janaki Amal. Um, who did research, you know, both in the global south and the global north, and you know was considered, you know, sort of a nomad uh, a scientist. Um, and and so there's a way in which, uh, you know, even when we think about other contexts uh, globally, um, it, it, it's not it's not you know other, you know, it, it's it's both. Um, you know, we we have to think in sort of a hybrid kind of space. Um, those are just my two quick, you know, thoughts. Um, we do need a lot more uh, work uh, in gender uh, studies of science, technology, and medicine, um, in you know, outside of North America and uh, Europe, you know, and 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 those are starting to happen. Thank you, John. Uh, Elena, yeah. before uh, yeah. before he, he you address my question, if if yeah. you want. Uh, yeah, I I would like to read two questions that uh, appeared here in the Q and A box, uh, and they are directed to you. The first one is by Catherine Jamy, who Don has been mentioning and uh, who was a speaker earlier today in this in this festival. Catherine first suggests that the the DHSP should uh, try to flesh out the gender structure of our own community, and I I think it's a very, very important proposal. And she asked uh, <laughs> whether your data on the history of science uh, uh, community in Italy has any information on, on gender. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Stefan Müller-Wille uh, asked you uh, why the definition of history of science, the one you, you, you've shown us, includes technology but le leaves medicine out of the picture. Uh, how is yeah. it in Italy? Yeah, so uh, starting with the, the last one. So in the first lines, we mentioned uh, medical sciences uh, as uh, uh, so physics, uh, but just in the first lines, <laughs> because yeah, uh, we have in Italy also the tradition of history of physics uh, on the one end, uh, on the other end, the history of medicine. That is, uh, we have collaboration. Some of historians of medicine join our society, but it's a completely different discipline. So uh, it uh, it's. Um, uh, a completely uh, different field of research uh, and is in another sector. They are most of all physicians uh, that uh, are interested in history, not all, because Maria Conforti, that is, she's also a friend, uh, she's working a lot with us, uh, but uh, uh, it's another thing. So academically speaking, so, but we mentioned medicine, we mentioned medicine, not only technology. And so the relationship are good, but we uh, are uh, a bit different. So uh, from uh, the academic point of view, so we um, uh, and uh, uh, the other on women. So uh, in, in Italian university, so we are eighteen women. Very few are full professors. So we are working on that, and in the society, women are. Uh, a lot so uh, especially in the early career but on all not only so we are working a lot uh, to foster to increase this number in the in Italian university so it's uh, one of the future goals also with a working group uh, thinking on gender not only from the 
scientific point of view, but also as an action to uh, increase the number uh, of women. And uh, so about uh, STS, uh, we are working. So thank you for the, uh, the questions because we are working with sociologists of science in Italy. They are not so many, but very active. Uh, they have a lot of ideas and we are working a lot with them. They are very interested in history of science and technology more than in philosophy of science, for example, in Italy. And so we are trying, we will organize in January in Naples um, uh, a workshop together. So we are starting um, a good collaboration with us. STS study and in Italy I think they are uh, uh, growing also this field so this is why we have um, uh, in the definition we have mentioned uh, society we have mentioned the public dimension and uh, things like that because we want to dialogue more uh, than in the past. Okay thank you Elena. Uh, we, we have no other questions here in this box Last minute, everybody, if you want to, to send in some, some questions, uh, I will I will post a couple more questions, uh, one to Edil, one to, to Don, not to, to Elena, because you had more more questions. Uh, and, and my questions to both of you, as you and Don are, are in a way similar. Uh, it's it's a little bit like let me start by by uh, gender and, and women uh, women's history uh, in HST. Uh, when we are talking about this, are we talking about a subject, a methodology, or are we talking about something? Let me say, even deeper, uh, related to the very gender gap to the structure of our field. And I, I, I also ask uh, Ezio, what, what is specific in the history of geology? Do you have to know a lot of geology to do the history of geology? Um, what is its relation to, to the field at large? So one minute for each one of you, uh, Ezio. I can see very, very briefly that, uh, yes, uh, you need to know science. We, we also emphasize this, this need in our group, which is made mainly by scientists, on the other hand. So uh, we also try to say that uh, scientists need to know historian, historical methodology as well. Um, but uh, there are also quite a very specific difference between, within chronological periods. You can read about uh, geological uh, theories of the 18th century, what we call geological theories in the 18th century, without the need to know too much geology. But then at a certain point, you arrive that you need to know geology. You know what I mean? So you can read what, what is written in the 18th century treatise of, of Hertz, theory of the Hertz. But then if you need to understand fully, you need a bit of science. You need the science as well. But if you go to the 19th century or 20th century, you absolutely need the nomenclature, you need the, the, the categories, you need the, the classification of modern science, of modern geology. Otherwise, you will make uh, uh, not a good history in this sense. So it's, it's a matter of time as well. And I would say in any case, you need to have both at the same, nearly at the same level. I started as an historian doing also cultural history, and then I moved to geology, and I learned geology as well. So I tried to balance the two, the two skills. Thank you. And John? Just very quickly, it's all of the above, Tomas, and I'd be curious to hear what uh, you're, you're thinking in terms of, you know, something deeper. Um, and I would just throw out there, and I think this resonates with what Ezio just said, uh, gender and these categories are historically contingent, and, you know, they themselves can be interrogated historically and should be. Um, so depending on context and discipline and, you know, so forth, uh, that's going to, you know, look, the narrative is going to, you know, look differently. So anyway, yeah, that's my quick answer to that. All of the above. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so uh, we, we need to wrap this session up. So many thanks to Edio Vakai, to Don Apet, 
and to Elena Canadelli, our three speakers. Many thanks to everybody who's been uh, here with us. We have session 20 starting right now. So uh, we finished this. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world, and welcome to the DHST Global History of Science and Technology Festival uh, 2023. My name is Sam Robinson, uh, and I'm going to chair this session, which is session 20. Uh, we're getting towards the end, but we still have fantastic speakers lined up for you. Um, our three speakers in this session are nominated by the member states of Spain, Canada and Norway. We're going to take the three papers together, as in one after the other, and then we'll take questions for whatever time is remaining to take us up to the top of the next hour. Um, you can send questions through to the panellists via the Q&A button, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen. Um, and it would be helpful if you could send us questions so that we uh, are not waiting for them. So as soon as they come to mind, as the, you're listening to the papers, put them in that Q&A button and we'll be ready for you uh, at the end of the, all three papers. So our first paper is uh, Joseph Simon from the Institute